are now listening to The Sports Report with your host, Josh Dow. What's up, everybody? Josh back with another episode of The Sports Report. I hope everyone's having a great week. I know I am after this past weekend with the Patriots coming out on top. I I really don't even know. I guess I do know what happened, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit in the headline section. Uh, So let's just jump right into that. Let's jump right into the headlines right now. This is The Sports Report News and Headlines. Um, the Patriots, man, they look dead in the water. They look like they had no shot. But Patriots come back. They were so wet. Basically, I'll give you a rundown of the game. It was 14-3. to Patriots had the ball. Looking like, basically, if they don't score right before the half, Jags get the ball back. There was about, I don't know, two minutes left at this point. You know, two-minute warning uh, at this point. Uh, The Patriots go three and out or, you know, don't have a sustained drive. The Jags might put up a field goal or another touchdown, and then this game's really out of hand. Uh, Well, Patriots uh, down the sideline. Uh, Boye gets called. I think it was Boye gets called for pass interference against Brandon Cooks. Uh, Really questionable call um they were battling back and forth i could see it going either way obviously as a patriots fan i was screaming past interference the whole time uh, but now that I've, I've seen it a few times um i'm on i'm on i'm on the fence about that call either way that's that was the call pass interference gives the patriots the ball inside the red zone basically um they score a touchdown the jags had you know, 55 seconds left in the half, so they still could have tried to get in field goal range, something like that, and they basically decided to take a knee and go into halftime up 14-10, and here's the, the biggest issue I have with this is you lost a lot of momentum when the Patriots scored. You were up 14-3, looking really good, going to get the ball at half if you're up 14-3. Now it's 14-10. Patriots at home have a little bit more momentum, which you definitely don't want them to have. You want to kind of knock the wind out of their sails. Even if you don't score a touchdown, just drive down the field a little bit, you know, kind of knock them in the mouth. That's that, that would have been enough. Uh, but taking a knee was, to me, that was out of fear. That was completely coaching in fear and you know, coaching like you, you know, you haven't been there before. And Jags uh, coach was asked about it. You know, he said, we want to make sure we had the lead going into half, you know, might've paraphrased that a little bit, but he basically said, we didn't want anything to go wrong. We didn't want to turn the ball over. We didn't want them to get the ball back, whatever. What we think about it, 50, Five seconds. The Patriots only had one timeout. Take a shot. Give Fournette the ball. Maybe he breaks 30 yards, 40 yards. If he doesn't, the play clock's 40 seconds. You Patriots call timeout. What, 50 seconds left on the clock? Then... You take two knees and go in half. You know, like, you you can't coach in fear like that. And and to me, I didn't really think about it until I saw what was going on second half. Uh, what I then I heard the coach 
come out and say, you know, we really just wanted to make sure we had the lead going in the half. He, he was coaching that game once they got up 14-3 not to blow the lead. He wasn't coaching to win. He was coaching to to not lose, and that's the worst way to coach. Coaching and fear is the worst way to coach, and you can see it. I mean, what did Herman Edwards say? You play to win the game. It's as simple as that, and he didn't do it. He didn't. Second half, multiple drives. This was the play calling. Run on first down. Deep pass, you know, 20, 25 yards or more down the field incomplete then a nice safe five yard six yard gain on third down they punt the ball the first time i really noticed that was uh when miles jack stripped the ball from Dion lewis you have all the momentum run a play action deep post or something to try and get the momentum back in your in your favor they didn't they ran the ball for no gain. Deep pass, incomplete. Uh, I don't know if it was a five-yard completion or five-yard run. I, I'm assuming it was a five-yard completion on third down, and they punted the ball back to the Patriots. So all that momentum they had from getting that strip on a trick play, you know, the Patriots were set up, and it was looking like, you know, one more block could have sprung Lewis maybe a touchdown or at least a huge gain to Jack makes an incredible play, strips the ball, and then Jacksonville's got the ball back. And then you go out and that was your play calling. It's it's unbelievable. So not only that, you, you, you incorporate what they did on defense in the first half. They pressured Brady. They were ultra aggressive ultra aggressive second half they let up on the pressure they they still pressured them they, i i know there was a couple third downs where um i forget i forget which linebacker it was but came free a uh, couple third downs he would you know blitz up the middle and they got to brady again and hit him those two or three third downs where they got to brady wouldn't that have been enough to say, hey, we probably shouldn't have stopped doing that. Let's dial it back up a little bit. Or, hey, Brady's got a lot of time in the pocket. He's finding Amendola. He's finding his running backs. He's, you know, they they got away from the pressure. And and this is almost what I was thinking. They came out in the second half like, okay, we got a lot of pressure on Brady that first half. They're going to make some adjustments for blocking. Uh, if we don't get to him because they made those adjustments, he's going to be able to find the open guy down the seam and get a big play. Which, okay. But now you want to sit back in zone or even in man and give Brady all day, you rush four. Someone's going to break off the route and get open. You can't cover someone for six seconds seven seconds i don't know the exact time that brady had in the pocket in the second half but you can't expect even even with the two corners that you have ramsey and boya you can't expect them to cover that long it's almost impossible then you look at even on the offensive side, what did Jacksonville do? They would run the ball, run screen passes, run pass uh, completions out to the to the flat, short passes across the middle. You know, they didn't really go downfield that much. I mean, they did, but not as frequently as they did in the second half. So game plan completely changed. I don't know what they saw in the tape from the first half that was like hey this game plan is i know we're up but this is what's going to bring it home because it didn't the game on the jacksonville side could have been coached exponentially better exponentially it's probably the the word i'm looking for either way should have been coached way better 
it was almost like I said he the coach got scared realized Brady and Belichick are on the other side and and I don't know if that's a real thing in in the NFL I it could be you know who you're playing against in college we knew who we were playing against when I played baseball we knew what pitchers were going to be on the mound game one two and three of the series game one if they're the all-americans on the mound it's a little bit different than you know game three when their third starters on the mound he's a little shaky coming off a couple couple l's it's a big difference so going into clutch time against brady and belichick you know you, you get a little tight you get a little tense and that ultimately lost the game. And I don't want to discredit the Patriots because they executed extremely well on offense. Defensively, my game plan for the whole week, when I looked at film of Jacksonville, when I looked at what the Patriots should be doing, when I looked at what the Steelers didn't do, the game plan was contain Fournette. You're not going to really stop them. They they did a pretty good job. Contain Fournette. Bring pressure on Bortles. And make him either make mistakes or not have time to just sit back in the pocket and throw the ball. Little dink and dunk passes. Bring the pressure. Bring the heat. Man behind the pressure, which they did, and make Bortles beat you. And clearly, the fourth quarter, Bortles was a non-factor. He had to throw the ball a bunch because they couldn't get the run going, and he was a non-factor. And I said that that should have been the game plan the whole game, and I completely understand now why why they didn't go that route. It's really hard to maintain that pressure, that consistency, the blitz packaging for 60 minutes of a football game. So I understand why they waited, you know, wait for that time to strike. My biggest issue with waiting was that game could have easily got out of hand. You know, playing against the Eagles, game could ease can easily get out of hand with the way that their defense plays. Foles is super impressive. We'll get into that a little bit, and you can't wait till the fourth quarter, down ten, to to make a comeback against the Eagles because their defense is uh, extremely impressive. So let's get into that Eagles game. Eagles and Vikings. This game, and I'm sure it wasn't just me, but it surprised the heck out of me. I couldn't believe, A, I didn't think the Eagles were going to win. I, and I'll be the first to admit, Eagles, super impressive. Super impressive, both sides of the ball. Vikings, I don't even know what to say because I just didn't see it coming. I mean, the Eagles dominated the game from beginning to end. Or we'll we'll say not exactly beginning because the Vikings' first drive looked real good. The Vikings' first drive, they came down, scored, and after I saw that touchdown, I said, oh, boy, we could be in for a show. And I was right. We were going to be in for a show, but a completely different show than I expected completely different here are some of the keys for that game the Eagles got to Case Keenum 8 times got a sack a pick 6 and then uh, a red zone fumble huge huge numbers there I think the first half Case Keenum was under pressure like 40% of the um, dropbacks that's a big number. If the Eagles find that success against the Patriots, 
I think we're gonna have uh I think we're gonna have an NFC team winning the Super Bowl because I just don't see the Patriots defense having as much success as the Eagles defense is gonna have if they get that kind of pressure. Nick Foles, once again, like I said, impressed the heck out of me. 26 for 33, 352, uh, three touchdowns, sounds right, and no picks. Uh, Listen, I jumped on the Foles bandwagon a long time ago, and then I hopped off. Hopped on the Carson Wentz bandwagon. I was a huge fan of of Wentz when he was in college. Huge fan. Um, not many people watch, you know, North Dakota State and, and you know FCS. Um, th- if you, I mean, I, even though they're st- they're not there, you know, Foles. I mean, Wentz isn't there anymore. Watch that program, and you'll see why Carson Wentz is the quarterback he is. So I jumped on the Carson Wentz bandwagon. Almost forgot Nick Foles was even or Foles was even a quarterback. Like just he like fell out of my head, out of my memory. And then you know, he comes back and didn't look great early, but now now he's looking like he did back when I was on the bandwagon. So, yes, it makes it easier when your defense is getting pick sixes and fumbles and, you know, all that stuff. But you're playing against a team that only gave up 15.8 points a game and you throw up 38 on them. And it wasn't... It almost seemed like it wasn't hard to get 38 they were running the ball at will. Blunt and Ajayi were doing whatever they wanted. Foles was obviously throwing the ball. Who was um, Jeffries or Jeffrey? Um, Alshon Jeffrey was just, I mean, wide open down the field multiple times. It just. For what I, I thought the Vikings defense was the best defense in the NFL, hands down. They. Okay, so every team's going to have blunders, every team's going to have hiccups. The Vikings team was the team that I thought was going to be the one that was like, mm, they're the least likely. And then I saw what happened last week with. The Saints game. And I was like, that's their hiccup. They escaped. That's their hiccup. And then... Man, they just... They couldn't... They couldn't get out of it. They couldn't... They just looked like they were sleepwalking through the game. They looked sluggish. Even on when, you know, Keenum wasn't getting pressured. Thielen and Diggs only had 98 yards. You know, those guys are, one of them should have 98 yards. The other one, 70, 80 yards if if Keenum and the Vikings were going to win that game. It was just an overall impressive performance by the Eagles. And the Patriots opened up as the favorite. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um but I wouldn't be surprised if we see that line adjust a little bit. And there's some factors that'll play into that, and we'll talk about that. But I'm super interested to see over the next two weeks how that line adjusts because we're going to have some early movement. We're going to have injuries and stuff that get announced. That's going to adjust the line, and then we're going to have some sharps getting in late. That'll adjust the line. So we'll see how that goes. I'll tell you what, though. Eagles 
They might not be the favorite in the game. They haven't been a favorite yet this playoff. They should start getting some respect from some some betters uh, in Vegas because uh, they, they've proven they're no joke. They definitely proven they're no joke. On to some draft talk. Josh Allen, quarterback from Wyoming. He's getting ready for the Senior Bowl. He's getting ready to uh, basically showcase his talent one more time before the Combine and uh, all the workouts and everything like that. And they, he had a little bit of a... I don't know if it was a press conference, an interview, what, what it was. But he basically said, I want to be the guy that turns Cleveland around. Cleveland, as everybody knows, has the first pick. He wants to go there. And he said he wants to be that guy. He said it'd be, it, he, it would be special to be that guy that turns Cleveland around. Um, which is great. That's awesome that you want to be that guy. But you don't think the 20 other quarterbacks they had in the last 18 years, whatever the number is, it's absurd, um, didn't want to be the guy? Didn't want to turn the team around? You think that they weren't trying to be the next franchise quarterback of Cleveland? Like, What makes him think he's going to be able to do it? They have a little bit of talent, but they don't have the talent that's going to help them beat the Steelers, the the Ravens, even the Bengals, or any other team that they have to play. Like They're just not there yet. He could be that piece. I think he's, he's size-wise, he's bigger, and he's a prototypical guy accuracy he struggled this year he wasn't a great quarterback I mean he was good you know everyone will say well you know he played at Wyoming he didn't have the best guys around him if you compare comparatively that's what he's going to have in Cleveland he's not going to have great guys around him and he didn't play great competition. He's going to be playing great competition in the NFL every week. He led Wyoming to seven wins. Granted, he lost a lot of talent. A lot of talent last year when they were however many wins they had. But the only wins seven games. He struggles with his accuracy. I don't think he's a first pick overall guy. I There's a lot of reports saying he is going to be. Cleveland loves him. But, I mean, this is like the year of the quarterback with Rosen and Darnold, um, Baker Mayfield, Luke Folk, uh, Mason Rudolph. You have all these guys coming out. Josh Allen from Wyoming, those guys all went to Power 5 schools, played real competition. Baker Mayfield won the Heisman. Some of these other guys put up unbelievable numbers. Josh Allen went to Wyoming, didn't play great, barely made, barely was bowl eligible. And he thinks he deserves to be number one pick overall. Deserves to be the one that turns Cleveland around. Thinks he's going to be the one that turns Cleveland around. That's that's far-fetched. I hope he does it. I, I love being proved wrong in these situations. But they were also saying Kaiser was going to be that guy. Look what happened. So we're we're still a few months away from the draft. We're getting close to the combine senior bowls this weekend. We'll see how he plays. You know, one of the last shows before the combine, uh, which the combine is great to see fundamentals. 
but the Senior Bowl, you know, you're going to get that real look at live action and everything like that. So this is going to be a big show. There's going to be a lot of, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of scouts there to, to take a look at them. And we'll see how it goes. Um, other NFL news, we got Jerry Jones says Jason Garrett's not on the hot seat. Apparently, this has been, like, a thing. You know, Jer- uh, Jason Garrett, like, being on the hot seat. And I've heard it, but... The, can we, like, let... I understand that it's the NFL, it's competitive, and y- they're chasing Super Bowls. But can we just understand... And I hate the Cowboys, and I hate Jason Garrett. But they went 9-7 and seven this year, which is not good. But they had Zeke Elliott suspended for over a third of the season. Last year they went 13-3. and three. They were the one seed in the NFC. I mean, they're clearly on an uptrend. Clearly on an uptrend. This year's an outlier. Zeke Elliott suspended. That hurts. Let's see what happens next year. Zeke's back. Hopefully the whole season. Let's hope no, no nothing else comes up. There's always going to be injuries and stuff like that. If we can keep our star players healthy. If I'm Jerry Jones, there's no reason to think Jason Garrett should be on the hot seat. Now next year, if they have everybody. If they have Zeke Elliott. They have Dak. They have Dez. They have all their guys to pick up a few free agents that are supposed to add a lot of talent, help offensive, defensive side of the ball. And they go 9-7 and seven again or 7-9, and 8-8. Eight and eight. Then we got to start considering maybe he is on the hot seat. Who knows? They could turn into the Giants next year and go 3-whatever. and whatever. Three and thirteen, not three and whatever. Clearly, three and thirteen. Um, I don't think you can. After what happened this year, I mean, you lose your best player on offense. It's tough, you know. It's tough to to rebound from that. So, Jason Garrett on the hot seat is a little bit of a stretch. And I'm glad Jerry Jones, even though he's an idiot, I'm glad that he's, you know, is in the right state of mind and not just going to fire Jason Garrett or anything like that just because they went 9-7 and seven without a Zeke Elliott. Um, NBA, NBA, basically what we got for the NBA is... The All-Star teams were announced, and LeBron scored 30,000 points, who is the youngest player to score 30,000 uh, out of the seven who have scored, so it's not like it's a huge list. Uh, but he is the youngest, which is a huge accomplishment. I don't know if he'll ever be at the level of Kareem and, and Karl Malone. I don't know if he'll ever reach those heights. Um, but... The pace he's on now, I think he... I mean, he'll definitely be top three, in my opinion. He might get Kareem. He might. um, But, man, 30,000 points. Uh, I think he's got, like, 7,000 assists, 7,000 rebounds as well. I think he's at that 30,000, 7,000, 7,000 mark. Um, I don't know if that'll ever be done again. And he's going to be close to... Um, he'll have 8,000 rebounds, 8,000 assists. He'll also over 40,000 points. So that right there, those numbers, nobody, I don't think anybody's ever going to do that again. I don't think anybody. And what, what got me thinking when I was watching this, um, kind of unfold is LeBron. Yes. Right now, best player. In the NBA. There's debates on if he's the best player ever. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of Jordan fans out there. Obviously, there's people on LeBron. You have a few that say 
whoever their favorite player is, um, Magic, stuff like that. So right now the main two you're talking about is LeBron and Jordan. Regardless of who your pick is, LeBron is doing something special right now. Just overall his longevity and how good of an athlete he is. So like we're witnessing some of the greatest athletes in the history of sports right now. In the history. In this generation. We're witnessing it. You have Brady. If you don't think he's the greatest quarterback, I know I've talked with some people who think Manning is the greatest quarterback. We witnessed him in this generation. We witnessed Brees, Drew Brees, um, Aaron Rodgers. You know, quarterback-wise, we're witnessing the greatest. We're witnessing the greatest NBA players. LeBron. I mean, we were younger when Jordan played. We have Curry, Durant, Harden is a great scorer. You know, the way that Anthony Davis is playing, he might go down as one of the best big men ever. You know, baseball, Trout, Kershaw. We're witnessing the best athletes in sports right now. And I mean, is it just overall their athletes are getting bigger, faster, stronger? Probably. But, and I'm not saying in 20 years we're not going to have this same conversation. And I hope I'm still doing this in 20 years where I'm, I'm... we're going through this again, and I'm saying, wow, remember when we talked about, if my memory is still with me, remember when we talked about LeBron and all these guys, now we have X, Y, and Z athletes that are doing it. But right now, is truly something special. Like I said, the NBA All-Star teams were announced. The starters for the East, Kyrie, DeMar DeRozan, LeBron, Giannis and Joel Embiid. Those are your starters. Uh, Reserves, you have Kyle Lowry, Bradley Beal, John Wall, Oladipo, Kevin Love. Uh, This is the first time I'm seeing these. So Kevin Love made it. Um, That's unbelievable. Um, Christophe Porzingis and Al Horford. I'm really shocked that um, Kevin Love made it. I guess he's having a good year. a better year than he normally does, but I'm going to have to look up some stats and see why he made it over some other guys. Um, First thing that jumps off at me, how is Kyrie and LeBron's relationship on the court going to be in the East? Um, I know, you know, the drama of it probably won't be anything, but that's something to uh, to to keep an eye on. You know, maybe Kyrie doesn't throw the ball to LeBron as much. Maybe he looks at to Giannis or something like that. Um, not that these stats or anything like that matter, but who knows what's going to happen in today's NBA anyway. The West, you have Steph Curry, James Harden, Kevin Durant, Anthony Davis, and DeMarcus Cousins. DeMarcus Cousins and Anthony Davis are playing out of their mind right now. Uh, Durant is getting thrown out of pretty much every game he plays this year. Harden and Steph Curry, two of the most ridiculous scorers and shooters in the game right now. Um, The reserves, Damian Lillard, Klay Thompson, Jimmy Butler, Russell Westbrook, LaMarcus Aldridge, Draymond... Green and Carl Anthony Towns cat is in it. So four Golden State Warriors made it. That doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me in any at all. I mean they're just that good. Um how is I want 
Westbrook and Durant on the floor together again. I want them on the floor together again. Uh, last year, they played together and they meshed pretty well. Man, that when that when that team was together, when Durant and Westbrook were together, and especially when they had Harden, wow, they were scary good. They were scary good, um, and I know the whole story with Harden. I mean, it was a few million bucks that kept it apart. If I was the GM to that team, I would be kicking myself because you could have had three of the best players. I mean, they could basically be the Golden State Warriors right now. They could be the Golden State Warriors. Um, man. Memories, huh? So, the the All Star Games is basically no defense at all. So there's going to be probably 400 points scored combined. Uh, I'm more into the three point contest and the dunk contest. I can't wait for that. Uh, but the starting lineups, I I still can't get over this Kevin Love deal. I still can't get over him making the All Star team. And the whole thing now with Kevin Love, maybe I'm just I'm just not giving him the credit that he's due. But we hear all this talk about his teammates getting on him. Um, I guess there's a report now that IT like started a revolt against Kevin Love. I don't know how true that is, but if he if he was playing at an all-star level, wouldn't you think the that the the Heat, yeah, how am I doing? The Cavs, don't you think the Cavs would be playing a little bit better than they are? Because you know LeBron's going to put up, you know, 25, 8, and 8, you know, 28, 7, and 7, something like that every game. I don't know what his numbers are this year, but he's always around there. Wouldn't he be in that? I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just I'm I'm missing something. Maybe I'm just not giving him the credit that's due. Uh, but those are the All Star teams. Let's get into. It's in. Kevin does it's done. He's showing my show with the final yeah. score. Miami by four. You covered. You covered twelve. I covered. Yes. <laughs> what is against the spread? The spread. The spread. With. College basketball, pro basketball, even baseball when it starts. The lines come out the day before, sometimes even the day of the game. So unless I start doing the show every day, which I'm going to have to start making more money, um, we're not going to be able to do it because by the time the show comes out, the games will be being played or over it just wouldn't make sense so what i'm going to do is we're going to look at any prop bets so i have one for you today that just came out uh the other day maybe even yesterday uh which would be tuesday then i'm going to go over some tips for betting i know a lot of people love to bet college basketball pro basketball so we'll go over some tips for that and then we'll go through um, different tips every week till we get to a point where maybe draft. I know there's going to be some things with the World Cup. There's going to be some things with, um, I don't know if the Olympics will have anything. Maybe. Maybe we'll we'll have something for the Olympics. Um, But there's always something. Golf is a huge one that I I love to, um, to put money on, especially with... Uh, When I used to go to the Travelers uh, with Joe from the BS Nerds, we used to go to the Travelers, and I know every hole I would be looking at my phone to see what's going on because I would put money on somebody. So golf's a fun one to put money on, so we'll talk about those as well. But today we're going to talk about the Super Bowl a little bit. We're not going to make a pick, but we're going to talk about the, the line, what to look for in the future in the next two weeks with that. We're going to talk about the odds for the Heisman 2018 that just came out. And we're going to talk some some college basketball, some tips for that. We got five of those, uh, five tips. So let's kick off against the spread with the Super Bowl. 
and the lines opened up at five and a half. The over under 48. So the over under stayed the same. The line dropped half a point, which not super surprising. Um, I expected it to be closer to three and a half, especially because of we don't know Gronk's condition yet. Uh, so we'll get into more of the analysis next week of the actual game. But here's what I want to look for in the next week to two weeks. First, is Gronk going to play? Right now, they're pretty optimistic he's going to play. If he does, line might shift to f- back to five and a half. I doubt that it's going to get to close to seven. That would be a stretch, and I'd be... Um, I feel like there'd be too much money coming in on the Eagles for it to do that unless there's, I mean, sharps on the Patriots. If he doesn't play, which, again, I don't know if he's going to. I would guess he's going to. He's got two weeks. If he doesn't, for whatever reason, we're going to see the money flood into the Eagles, and it's going to bring this line down. So what I want you to look for is the obviously the report. I'm sure if you are a Patriots fan, an Eagles fan, or a sports fan in general, you either have the ESPN app, the Bleacher Report app, or at least watch some sports news uh, show once a day where you'll get a notification about Gronk. If the report comes out he's not playing, Give it, I don't know, four hours, depending on the time that it comes out. If it comes out in the morning, give it time so the West Coast, everything like that, has time to to get into it. If it's at night, depending where you are, um, it might be as soon as like 30 minutes the line could drop. The thing is, if the money floods, and the way I think it could happen, especially if he's like 100% out, not questionable, not game time decision, I mean, they say he's a no-go, this line could drop to, I don't know, three and a half, which to me is really hard to pick either way. Like, I will really have to do an analysis if it gets to three and a half. Patriots are notorious for winning games last drive by a field goal, something like that. So I'm going to wait to see the situation with Gronk. Hopefully it comes out before the next recording. But it's already dropped a half a point. I expect to continue to drop, especially if Gronk doesn't play. But we'll, like I said, we'll talk about that. Um, odds for next year's Heisman. Talked about it a little bit, and we had some of the guys on there that I was, you know, after the Heisman was announced, who was the favorite. Here's, now that we have pretty much everyone declared, here's what here's what I think is going to happen. Anyway, well, we'll, let's start with the favorites. Let's start with the favorites. Bryce Love, 7-1. to one. Jonathan Taylor, running back from Wisconsin, eight to one. Khalil Tate, quarterback for Arizona, nine to one. Great player. If you haven't watched him play, he's a great player. Um, Tua, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce his last name, even though I'm an Alabama fan. He's the quarterback that led them to the national championship. He's now ten to one, who probably didn't have odds. If you were able to see 2018 odds for the national championship, like right after the Heisman, Tua was probably, if you could even pick him, 100, 250 to 1, maybe even more than that. So if you jumped on him, you got some great value. Um, J.K. Dobbins running back from Ohio State, probably one of the best running backs in the country. Uh, Obviously, he's the third running back favorite here, but... 
Bryce Love and Jonathan Taylor are phenomenal. This kid is, uh, J.K. Dobbins is a sophomore now, or going to be a sophomore next year, I believe. Um, kid's a stud. So definitely watch out for him. Jake Fromm, quarterback from Georgia, 12 to 1. Jared Stinham, quarterback, Auburn, 12 to 1. Uh, do, do, do. Will Greer, quarterback, West Virginia, 12 to 1. That is one I would not touch with a 100 foot pole. Um, the reason for that is I just, I'm not confident that he's a good quarterback. I'm not confident he's a quarterback that would win the high. Like he, I don't think he's better than, than from or Stenham. I don't even think he's better than Kelly Bryant. Who's 15 to one from Clemson. He just, he doesn't strike me as somebody who is going to consistently put up the numbers to win the Heisman. So I'm not going to go with him. Two of the biggest things, two of the biggest names that I see on here that I would look into. One, Nick Fitzgerald, quarterback from Mississippi State, 35 to 1 odds. I don't know if you watched any of him play before his um, injury this year. The kid is like a taller Tim Tebow. And everybody knows what Tebow did in college. So I don't know how good Mississippi State's supposed to be next year. They'll probably be top, I would say probably top 20 with him. They, they have some good players on that team. Um, he would be someone to look for 35 to one odds and then Ed Oliver and Nick Bosa. So two defensive players are on this list. I wouldn't suggest putting money cause we all know how hard it is for defensive players to win the Heisman, but it's interesting to see 55 to one odds and 75 to one odds, two defensive linemen and they're saying Ed Oliver and Nick Bosa are, I mean, they are definitely the two best defensive linemen in the country. They were talking about, I want to say, was it Ed Oliver? They were talking about using him on offense next year a little bit. Uh, so if they do that, that's where you might see that value. So I don't know if anyone gets the um, Athens um, um Preseason magazine, while wow, my mind is shot right now. Uh, any of the preseason magazines or anything like that, if you keep up to with the, the college football season, if they say that Ed Oliver is going to be a third down running back or a tight end or used in packages, if he's used enough, he might find himself at least a finalist. Um, so keep an eye on that. Honestly... If Bryce Love has another season like he did this year, he's going to be a finalist. If Tua wins the quarterback battle, I could see him being a finalist. And I'm really impressed with that quarterback from Georgia, Jake Fromm. So I would keep an eye on him. But my sleeper for this one is Nick Fitzgerald. Uh, 35 to 1 odds. That's the guy that I would definitely I would take if if I wanted to get some, some huge value. Even if you threw 10 bucks on Nick Fitzgerald. You win 350 if he wins the Heisman right now. So, obviously, he's coming off a scary injury, so we don't know how much he will recoup. But man, the kid is a, the kid's a baller. So keep an eye on that. Now we're gonna get into five tips for betting basketball. So this is both college and NBA. Some of them are gonna be more. College, some of them are going to be more NBA focused, um, but there's five. So the first one's, I mean, it's about as obvious as you can get. Check any injury reports, especially like say you're going to bet tonight's whoever's playing game. Check the injury report, check who is game time decisions, check who's banged up but is going to play. You know, if I'm watching Oklahoma play and uh, Trey Young, who is their 
their all-star player. Uh, you know, he's scoring like 40 points a game. Not really, but close to it. Um, he might be sprained ankle, injured, something like that. That's something you want to keep an eye on. He might still be playing, but he might be banged up. Uh, also, check where the game is. If it is a top 25 matchup, home court advantage means a little bit. I also want to put out there that a team... So I'll give I'll give an example here. Pitt. We'll say Pitt. Say Pitt is playing at home against... Duke. Duke's probably going to be favored by 30 points. I don't know. But that's a game where Duke's clearly the better team, and even though they're on the road, they're going to be favored by a lot. That's where you might go pit plus 30, simply because they're at home, gives them a little bit of home court advantage. Plus, that game with the crowd behind them is going to go a long way for a team that might be on the bubble in March. You know, they need that signature win on their resume. And they're not going to beat Duke on the road. That might be it. So, keep an eye on that stuff. The number two... And this is super important to me. I know a lot of handicappers um, also feel this way. Don't bet with emotion. Don't bet on your favorite teams. Don't bet on your favorite players. I always say, and I I have done it. So I'm not going to say like never do it, but I, I, it's really hard to, to pick a team that you're a fan of without bias. So, I always say that I hate to bet on Alabama football. A, because I'm super superstitious, and I feel like, super superstitious, I feel like if I pick Alabama to beat Old Miss by 9.5, that not only am I worrying about them winning, I'm worrying about them covering the line, and I might have jinxed them. I mean, that's just the way I work. I'm, 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 my mind, that's how I work. Also, you also have the bias of, well, we're definitely a better team, especially against a rival. We're definitely a better team. No doubt are we better. We should win. Even when you lose, man, we should have won that game. We're the better team. You're, you're picking with your emotions. You don't want to do that. So if you're that kind of person... Stand clear of betting on your favorite teams. I know sometimes it makes the games more exciting. I did bet on the national championship. Luckily, I was able to stay clear of the emotions. But if you are going to, make sure you do your research. Try and make the choice without any bias. And don't pick on emotions the third thing don't just pick a game because it seems the don't pick a don't pick a game because it's almost too good to, like duke they're scoring 100 points a game well maybe the line is 150. So you're like, wow. You know, their defense isn't that great. Their offense, you know, no one can stop them. This is going to easily go 160 in the over under. Look at do your research. Look at the stats. Look at the defensive fit, defensive efficiency. Look at the team they're playing against. Look at the offensive efficiency. Look at turnovers. Look at free throw shooting. I mean, you have to look at all these stats because there's a reason the lines are set the way they are. A great example. A team that has great 
defensive efficiency playing against a team who turns the ball over a lot is going to be a huge factor in who can win that game. You know, we're going to look at there's a game coming up Saturday. Virginia against Duke. The line hasn't come out yet. Virginia's number two, Duke's number four. You're gonna if you don't know anything about Virginia, all you know is they're number two in the country. You know Duke has been scoring out of the gym. You might see the the over under, and we'll talk about over unders again in, in a minute. You might see the over under at one, probably not even one fifty, one forty something, and you'd be like, wow, that seems way too good to be true. I'm gonna put a thousand dollars on the over. You have to understand Virginia has given up like 40 points a game, probably more than that, but their their defense is what drives them. They play half court offense. They use great defense and pressure. Duke would be lucky to score 70 points that game. So there's you always got to look at the factors, the stats, how they match up against the team they're playing and how that team's stats match up against every, you know, like if Duke's playing Virginia, you have to look at both sides. It seems obvious, but you won't believe how many times people are just like, Hey, I'm throwing money on XYZ university to cover six and a half. And I'll, I'll, why? The, I mean, they're just a better team. Are they, though? Because they run the ball 800 times a game. I'm talking football here, not basketball. This is just an example. They run the ball 800 times a game. The team they're playing hasn't given up a rushing touchdown all game or all year and has played four teams that are better rushing attacks than them. Oh, I didn't know that. Exactly. You got to do the research. Number four. This is more NBA stuff. This is more NBA. Also can affect college basketball, but not as much, especially in conference play. Now that we're in conference play, it's not going to matter as much. But NBA, this definitely matters. Road trips. Long road trips. And back-to-backs. Any team that travels, for example, Celtics go to L.A. That, no matter what, Celtics are way better than the Lakers. I don't think anyone's going to argue that. Maybe LeVar Ball. Celtics are way better than the Lakers. Going to L.A., time zone change, Even if they don't have a back-to-back or a long road trip or they're just going there for a quick game and then they're heading back east, it's an easy way for them not to cover an eight, nine-point spread and lose the game outright. Teams traveling to different zones, especially coming west to east, Long trips. There's teams that will go and play Houston, San Antonio, Dallas. You know, they'll they'll travel basically all of Texas. By the time they get to that third game on that road trip, players will be resting. They'll their legs will be gone. The team they're playing, especially if it's like the Rockets who are probably a better team unless it's Golden State. That team could be on a home stint where you know they just won a big game, had a day off, and then they're playing again, so they had a little bit of time to rest. They didn't have to travel. Things like that make a difference. So you could see Dallas, who's not a good team, favored over a mediocre team. And if everything were perfect in a perfect world, they had the same amount of rest. They had to travel the same amount. 
Dallas would probably be the underdog or a bigger underdog. But then you see the line out, you know, two, or you see them actually favored. There's a reason for that. Look at that stuff. The last thing, the over under is the easiest way to lose money. It's the easiest way to make money, but it's the easiest way to lose money. And I learned that early. I learned that early. And the reason is, is I didn't do research. I talked about it with the stats. You have to do it with this as well. The over-under is one of my favorite things to play in almost every sport. Almost every sport. You have to look at efficiency, offense, and defense, both teams. Look at tempo. I talked about it with the Duke and Virginia game. Duke and Virginia are almost polar opposites. So you have to look at who's more likely to win the tempo. Look at history. I know in the the in college basketball it's a little bit different because Duke has four starters who were in high school last year. So history might not matter. But you have to look at the way the teams... You have to look at history because of the coaches. Duke is going to want to push the floor. If they've done that in the past, they have young players. Did they turn the ball over a lot? If they had any other opponent like that. Is there anybody that's similar to who they played that's like Virginia? If there are, did they score 80 points? No. Mm. then they're probably not going to do it against Virginia, who's probably the best defense in the country. Virginia, have they played anyone as high-powered of an offense as Duke? They did. How many points did they score? They only gave up 55? All right. You have to look at that stuff. Also, like I said, it's the easiest way to make money, but the easiest way to lose money. There's games that I still look at. College basketball is a perfect example. There'll be a game where it's just like, maybe I don't know the two teams as well. It could be like Vermont versus New Hampshire. Just throwing two random teams out there. And the over-under could be 117. And I'm just like, 117? All they have to do is score 60 points? Well, I mean, jeez. High school teams score 60 points, so let's take the over. Guys, the line is the line is under 120 for a reason. That's why you have to look up. Maybe both teams' defenses are top in the conference. Maybe the two best scorers for each team are out. Maybe the offensive efficiency is not that good, and they're only scoring 50 points a game. Both teams. There's a reason for the lines. There's a reason for the over-unders. The sports books are in business for a reason. They're not in business because they're giving away billions of dollars every year. The line makers are have a job because they're making the sports books money. These guys are professionals. Do your research. And, and honestly, you're not going to win every time I was just looking at my 2017 year to date well I guess not year to date anymore because it's 2018 my 2017 yearly betting what I won and what I lost so over the course of the whole 2017 so that's going to include NBA MLB college basketball college football um, NFL. I don't really bet on hockey or anything like that. Um, I was 54%, which seems like, wow, that's not very good. If you're 52, 53%, you're, you're in a pretty good spot. 54% decent. You get to 55, 56%. You're, you're 
the best. You're one of the best. And I'm I'm not going to even claim that I'm close to that. Um, Trust me, there's some games that I got really lucky on. Uh, Let's talk about the national championship. So, you know, 54%, I'm super happy with. I didn't lose, so that's good. But there's going to be weeks you're going to lose. Don't bet. Don't bet, you know, 50% of your money, 50% of your bankroll, as they call it, on one game. I've never bet more than 10% on one bet. And I knew that that was 100% uh, a win. Like, it was without a doubt a win. So, that's something to keep in mind. Those are the five tips. We'll go more in depth. I am really intrigued with the baseball season. We'll get into those as spring training comes around. We'll have uh, the Super Bowl next. Yeah, next week we'll have the Super Bowl talk. My mind is fried, guys. Um, We'll also get into uh, some more tips and everything like that. The last thing is the what to watch for. Real, real, real quick five things. The Pro Bowl, which, as you know, there's, well, I don't know if you know this, but you you will now. Usually there's no lines for the Pro Bowl just because nobody knows what's going to happen. Um you could see a 70 to 69 game you could see a 10 to 7 game you don't really know what you're going to see so if you happen to see lines for the pro bowl if it's oh, if the over under is in the 60s you might want to take the over but i've never seen i've never seen a line for the pro bowl some college basketball you have Thursday, number 25, Michigan, at number 3, Purdue. Saturday at 2 p.m., number 2, Virginia, at number 4, Duke. Tuesday, next Tuesday, number 10, UNC, at number 18, Clemson. And then the Senior Bowl is Saturday. Like I said, you got to look at Josh Allen see what he's going to do. But you're going to watch a lot. If you're if you're into the draft and everything, this is going to be one of the last times you're going to see these guys on the field before your team drafts. So keep an eye on the Senior Bowl. That is Saturday at 1.30. And I think that's all I got for you guys. So again, guys, it's always a pleasure. I hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Have a great weekend. And until next time, guys, take care.